story twenty one of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty one retiring from business what the colonel's business was nobody knew nor did any one care particularly he purchased for cash only and he never grumbled at the price of anything that he wanted who could ask for more than that curious people occasionally wondered how when it had been fully two years since the colonel with every one else abandoned duck creek to the chinese he managed to spend money freely and to lose considerable at cards and horse races in fact the keeper of that one of the two challenge hill saloons which the colonel did not patronize was once heard to absent-mindedly wonder whether the colonel hadn't a money mill somewhere where he turned out double eagles and slugs the coast name for fifty dollar gold pieces when so important a personage as a barkeeper indulged publicly in an idea the inhabitants of challenge hill like good californians everywhere considered themselves in duty bound to give it grave consideration so for a few days certain industrious professional gentlemen who won money of the colonel carefully weighed some of the brightest pieces and tested them with acids and tasted them and sawed them in two and retried them and melted them up and had the lumps assayed the result was a complete vindication of the colonel and a loss of considerable custom to the indiscreet barkeeper the colonel was as good-natured a man as had ever been known at challenge hill but being mortal the colonel had his occasional times of despondency and one of them occurred after a series of races in which he had staked his all on his own bay mare tipsy and had lost looking reproachfully at his beloved animal failed to heal the aching void of his pockets and drinking deeply swearing eloquently and glaring defiantly at all mankind were equally unproductive of coin the boys at the saloon sympathized most feelingly with the colonel they were unceasing in their invitations to drink and they even exhibited considerable christian forbearance when the colonel savagely dissented with every one who advanced any proposition no matter how incontrovertible but unappreciated sympathy grows decidedly tiresome to the giver and it is with a feeling of relief that the boy saw the colonel stride out of the saloon mount tipsy and gallop furiously away riding on horseback has always been considered an excellent sort of exercise and fast riding is generally admitted to be one of the most healthful and delightful means of exhilaration in the world but when a man is so absorbed in his exercise that he will not stop to speak to a friend and when his exhilaration is so complete that he turns his eyes from well-meaning thumbs pointing significantly into doorways through which a man has often passed while seeking bracing influences it is but natural that people should express some wonder the colonel was well known at toddy flat lone hand blazers murders bar and several other villages through which he passed and as no one had been seen to precede him betting men were soon offering odds that the colonel was running away from somebody strictly speaking they were wrong but they won all the money that had been staked against them for within half an hour's time there passed over the same road an anxious-looking individual who reined up in front of the principal saloon of each place and asked if the colonel had passed had the gallant colonel known that he was followed and by whom there would have been an extra election held at the latter place very shortly after for the colonel's pursuer was no other than the constable of challenge hill and for constables and all other officers of the law the colonel possessed hatred of unspeakable intensity on galloped the colonel following the stage road which threaded the old mining camps on duck creek but suddenly he turned abruptly out of the road and urged his horse through the young pines and bushes which grew thickly by the road while the constable galloped rapidly on to the next camp 
there seemed to be no path through the thicket into which the colonel had turned but tipsy walked between trees and bushes as if they were but the familiar objects of her own stable-yard suddenly a voice from the bushes shouted what's up business that's what replied the colonel it's time replied the voice and its owner a bearded six-footer emerged from the bushes and stroked tipsy's nose with the freedom of an old acquaintance we ain't had a nip since last night and there ain't a cracker or a handful of flour in the shanty the old gal go back on yer yes replied the colonel ruefully lost every blasted race twasn't her fault bless her she done her level best everybody to home you bet said the man and bein a prayin for yer to turn up with the rock and something with more colour than spring water come on the man led the way and tipsy and the colonel followed and the trio suddenly found themselves before a small log hut in front of which sat three solemn disconsolate-looking individuals who looked appealingly at the colonel mack'll tell you how twas fellers said the colonel meekly while i picket the mare the colonel was absent but a few moments but when he returned each of the four men was attired in pistols and knives while mack was distributing some dominoes made from a rather dirty flour bag tain't so late as all that is it inquired the colonel better be an hour ahead than miss it this ere night said one of the four i ain't been so thirsty since i come round the horn in fifty and we'll run short of water somebody'll get hurt if there's no bitters on the old concern they will or my name ain't perkins don't count your chickies before they're hatched perky said one of the party and he adjusted his domino under the rim of his hat supposin there should be too many for us stiddy cranks remonstrated the colonel nobody ever gets along if they allow themselves to be skeered fact chimed in the smallest and thinnest man of the party the bible says something mighty hot about that i disremember exactly how it goes but i've heerd parson buzzy down in maine preach a rippin old sermon from the text many a time the old man never thought what a comfort them sermons was a goin to be to a road agent though that time we stopped slim mike's stage and he didn't have no more manners than to draw on me them sermons was a perfect blessin to me the thought of em cleared my head as quickly as a cocktail and i don't want to disturb log roller's pious yarn interrupted the colonel but as it's old black that's drivin to-day instead of slim mike and as old black allers makes his time hadn't we better vamoose the door of the shanty was hastily closed and the men filed through the thicket until near the road when they marched rapidly on parallel lines with it after about half an hour perkins who was leading halted and wiped his perspiring brow with his shirt sleeve far enough from home now said he tain't no use being a gentleman if you have to work too hard safe enough i reckon replied the colonel we'll do the usual i'll halt em log roller attend to the driver cranks takes the boot and mark and perk takes right and left and i know it's tough but considerin how everlastin eternally hard up we are i reckon we'll have to ask contributions from the ladies too if there's any aboard eh boy reckon so replied log roller with a chuckle that seemed to inspire even his black domino with a merry twinkle or two what's the use of women's rights if they don't ever have a chance of exercising them having their purses borrowed had showed them the whole doctrine in a brand new light they're treacherous critters women is remarked cranks some of em might put a knife into a feller while he was apologizin even you're afeard of em said perkins you can go back and clean up the shanty reminds me of what the bible says said log roller there's a lion on the trail i'll be chawed up says the lazy galoot or words to that effect come come boys interposed the colonel don't mix religion and business they don't mix no more than hello there's the crack o old black's whip pick your bushes quick i'll jump when i whistle each man secreted himself near the roadside the stage came swinging along handsomely the inside passengers were laughing heartily about something and old black was just given a delicate touch to the flank of the off leader when the colonel gave a shrill quick whistle and the five men sprang into the road the horses stopped as suddenly as if it was a matter of common occurrence 
old black dropped his reins crossed his legs and stared into the sky and the passengers all put out their heads with a rapidity equalled only by that with which they withdrew them as they saw the dominoes and revolvers of the road agents seems to be something the matter gentlemen said the colonel blandly as he opened the door won't you please get out don't trouble yourselves to draw cause my friend here's got his weapon cocked and his finger is rather nervous ain't got a handkerchief have you asked the colonel of the first passenger who descended from the stage have well now that's lucky just put your hands behind you please so that's it and the unfortunate man was securely bound in an instant the remaining passengers were treated with similar courtesy and then the colonel and his friends examined the pockets of the captives old black remained unmolested for whoever heard of a stage driver having money boys said the colonel calling his brother agents aside and comparing receipts tain't much of a haul but there's only one woman and she's old enough to be a feller's grandmother better let her alone huh like enough she'll pan out more'n all the rest of the stage put together growled cranks carefully testing the thickness of case of a gold watch just like the low live deceitfulness of some folks to hire an old woman to carry their money so it go safe maybe what she's got on ain't nothing to some folks that's got hosses that can win em money at races but the colonel abruptly ended the conversation and approached the stage the colonel was very chivalrous but crank's sarcastic reference to tipsy needed avenging and as he could not consistently with business arrangements put an end to crank's the old lady would have to suffer i beg your parding ma'am said the colonel raising his hat politely with one hand while he reopened the coach door with the other but we're a taking up a collection for some very deservin object we was a goin to make the gentlemen fork over the whole amount but as they ain't got enough we'll have to bother you the old lady trembled and felt for her pocket-book and raised her veil the colonel looked into her face slammed the stage door and sitting down on the hub of one of the wheels stared vacantly into space nothin queried perkins in a whisper and with a face full of genuine sympathy no yes said the colonel dreamily that is untie em and let the stage go ahead he continued springing to his feet i'll hurry back to the cabin and the colonel dashed into the bushes and left his followers so paralyzed with astonishment that old black afterward remarked that if there had been anybody to hold the hosses he would have cleaned out the whole crowd with his whip the passengers now relieved of their weapons were unbound and allowed to re-enter the stage and the door was slammed upon which old black picked up his reins as coolly as if he had merely laid them down at the station while horses were being changed then he cracked his whip and the stage rolled off while the colonel's party hastened back to their hut fondly inspecting as they went certain flasks they had obtained while transacting their business with the occupants of the stage great was the surprise of the road agents as they entered their hut for there stood the colonel in a clean white shirt and in a suit of clothing made up from the limited spare wardrobes of the other members of the gang but the suspicious cranks speedily subordinated his wonder to his prudence as he laying on the table a watch two pistols a pocket-book and a heavy purse he exclaimed come colonel business before pleasure let's divide and scatter if anybody should hear about it and find our trail and catch us with the traps in our possession they might divide yourselves said the colonel with abruptness and a great oath i don't want none of it colonel said perkins removing his own domino and looking anxiously into the leader's face be you sick here's some bully brandy i found in one of the passengers pockets i hain't nothin replied the colonel i'm a-goin and i'm a-retirin from this business forever ain't a-goin to turn evidence cried hanks grasping the pistol on the table i'm a-goin to make a lead mine o you if you don't take that back roared the colonel with a bound which caused cranks to drop his pistol and retire precipitately backward apologizing as he went i'm goin to tend to my own business and that's enough to keep any man busy somebody lend me fifty till i see him again perkins pressed the money into the colonel's hand and within two minutes the colonel was on tipsy's back and galloping on in the direction the stage had taken 
he overtook it he passed it and still he galloped on the people at mud gulch knew the colonel well and made it a rule never to be astonished at anything he did but they made an exception to the rule when the colonel canvassed the principal bar-rooms for men who wished to purchase a horse and when a gambler who was flush obtained tipsy in exchange for twenty slugs only a thousand dollars when the colonel had always said that there wasn't gold enough on top of the ground to buy her mud gulch experienced a decided sensation one or two enterprising persons speedily discovered that the colonel was not in a communicative mood so every one retired to his favourite saloon and bet according to his own opinion of the colonel's motives and actions but when the colonel after remaining in a barber shop for half an hour emerged with his face clean-shaven and his hair neatly trimmed and parted betting was so wild that a cool-headed sporting man speedily made a fortune by betting against every theory that was advanced then the colonel made a tour of the stores and fitted himself to a new suit of clothes carefully eschewing all the generous patterns and pronounced colours so dear to the average miner he bought a new hat put on a pair of boots and pruned his finger-nails and stranger than all he mildly but firmly declined all invitations to drink as the colonel stood in the door of the principal saloon where the stage always stopped the challenge hill constable was seen to approach the colonel and tap him on the shoulder upon which all men who had bet that the colonel was dodging somebody claimed the stakes but those who stood near the colonel heard the constable say colonel i take it all back and i own up fair and square when i seed you get out of challenge hill it come to me all of a sudden that you might be in the road agent business so i followed you duty you know but after i seed you sell tipsy i knowed i was on the wrong trail i wouldn't suspect you now if all the stages in the state was robbed and i'll give you satisfaction any way you want it it's all right said the colonel with a smile the constable afterward said that nobody had any idea of how curiously the colonel smiled when his beard was off give this fifty to jim perkins first time you see him i'm leaving the state suddenly the stage pulled up at the door with a crash and the male passengers hurried into the saloon in a state of utter indignation and impecuniosity the story of the robbery attracted everybody and during the excitement the colonel slipped quietly out and opened the door of the stage the old lady started and cried george and the colonel jumping into the stage and putting his arms tenderly about the trembling form of the old lady exclaimed mother end of story twenty one Story twenty two of Romance of California Life by John Haverton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story twenty two The Hard Hack Mistake. Excitement? The venerable Deacon Twinkum, the oldest inhabitant, said there had not been such an excitement at Hard Hack since the meeting house steeple blew down in a terrible equinoctial forty seven years before. And who could wonder? even a larger town than hardhack would have experienced unusual agitation at seeing one of its own boys who had a few years before gone away poor slender and twenty come back with broad shoulders a full beard and a pocketful of money dug out of the ugly hills of nevada but even the return of nathan brown in so unusual a condition for a hard hackian to be found in was not the fullness of hard hack's excitement for nathan had brought with him tom croon and harry faxton two friends he had made during his absence and both of them broad-shouldered full-bearded and auriferous as nathan himself no wonder the store at hard hack was all the while crowded with those who knew all about nathan or wanted to no wonder that seen em was the passing form of salutation for days the news spread like wildfire and industrious farmers deliberately took a day drove to town and stood patiently on the doorsteps of the store until they had seen one or more of the wonderful men 
the good deacon tweakum himself who had at a late prayer meeting stated that his feet already felt the splashing of jordan's waves temporarily withdrew his aged limbs from the rugged banks famed in song and caused them to bear him industriously up and down the ridge road past nathan's mother's house until he saw all three of the bearded croesuses seat themselves on the piazza to smoke then he departed his good face affording an excellent study for a simeon in the temple even the peaceful influences of the sabbath were unable to restore tranquillity to hardhack on sunday morning the meeting-house was fuller than it had been since the funeral service of the last pastor at each squeak of the door every head was quickly turned and when in the middle of the first hymn the three ex miners filed decorously in the staring organist held one chord of wyndham so long that the breath of the congregation was entirely exhausted the very pulpit itself succumbed to the popular excitement and the rev abegnego choker after reading of the treasures of solomon's temple and of the glories of the new testament for the first and second lessons preached from isaiah forty six six they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver in the balance but all this excitement was as nothing compared with the tumult which agitated the tender hearts of the maidens at hardhack young old handsome plain smart and stupid until now few of them had dared to hope for a change of name for while they possessed as many mental and personal charms as girls in general all the enterprising boys of hardhack had departed from their birthplace in search of the lucre which hardhack's barren hills and lean meadows failed to supply and the cause of their going was equally a preventive of the coming of others to fill their places but now oh hope here were three young men good-looking rich and if the other two were fit companions for the well-born and bred nathan all safe custodians for tender hearts few girls were there in hardhack who did not determine in their innermost hearts to strive as hard as yankee wit and maiden modesty would allow for one of those tempting prizes nor were they unaided rich and respectable sons-in-law were scarce enough the world over so it was no wonder that all the parents of marriageable daughters strove to make hardhack pleasant for the young men fathers read up on nevada and cultivated the three ex miners mothers ransacked cook-books and old trunks ladies companions were industriously searched for pleasing patterns crimping irons and curling tongs were extemporized and the demand for ribbons and trimmings became so great that the storekeeper hurried to the city for a fresh supply then began that season of mad hilarity and reckless dissipation which seemed almost a dream to the actors themselves and to which patriotic hardhackians have since referred to with feelings like those of the devout jew as he recalls the glorious deeds of his forefathers or of the modern roman as from the crumbling arches of the Colosseum, he conjures up the mighty shade of the caesarean period the fragrant bohea flowed as freely as champagne would have done in a less pious locality ethereal sponge cakes and transparent currant jellies became too common to excite comment the surrounding country was heavily drawn upon for fatted calves chickens and turkeys and mince pies were so plenty that observing children wondered if the governor had not decreed a whole year of special thanksgiving bravely the three great catches accepted every invitation and though it was a very unusual addition to his regular duties the rev abegnego choker faithfully attended all the evening festivities to the end that they might be decorously closed with prayer as had from time to time immemorial been the custom of hardhack and the causes of all these efforts on the part of hardhack society enjoyed themselves intensely young men of respectable inclinations who have lived for several years in a society composed principally of scoundrels and modified only by the occasional presence of an honest miner or a respectable mule-driver would have considered as elysium a place far less proper and agreeable than hardhack 
in fact the trio was so delighted that its eligibility soon became diminished in quantity faxton at one of the first parties made an unconditional surrender to a queenly damsel while nathan having found his old school-day sweetheart still unmarried whispered something in her ear probably the secret of some rare cosmetic which filled her cheeks with roses from that time forth but croon the handsomest and most brilliant of the three still remained and over him the fight was far more intense than in the opening of the campaign when weapons were either rusty or untried and the chances of success were seemingly more numerous but to designate any particular lady as surest of success seemed impossible even nathan and faxton when besought for an opinion by the two ladies who now claimed their innermost thoughts could only say that no one but croon knew and perhaps even he didn't croon was a very odd boy they said excellent company the best of good fellows the staunchest of friends and the very soul of honour but there were some things about him they never could understand in fact he was something like that sum of all impossibilities a schoolgirl's hero but harry said the prospective mrs faxton with rather an angry pout for a church member in full communion just see what splendid girls are dying for him i'm sure there are no nicer girls anywhere than in hardhack and he needn't be so stuck up my dear interrupted faxton i say it with fear and trembling but perhaps croon don't want to be in love at all an indignant flash of doubt went over the lady's face just notice him at a party continued faxton he seems to distribute his attentions with exact equality among all the ladies present as if he were trying to discourage the idea that he was a marrying man well said the lady still indignant i think you might ask him and settle the matter excuse me my dear replied faxton i have seen others manifest an interest in croon's affairs and the result was discouraging i'd rather not try the experiment a few mornings later mrs leekins who took the place of a newspaper at hardhack was seen hurrying from house to house on her own street and such housekeepers as saw her instantly discovered that errands must be made to houses directly in mrs leekins's route mrs leekins's story was soon told croon had suddenly gone to the city first purchasing the cottage which deacon twinkham had built several years before for a son who had never come back from sea croon had hired old mrs bruff to put the cottage to rights and to arrange the carpets and furnitures which he was to forward immediately but who was to be mistress of the cottage mrs leekins was unable to tell or even to guess the clerks at the store had been thoroughly pumped but while they admitted that one young lady had purchased an unusual quantity of inserting another had ordered a dress pattern of grey empress cloth which was that year the fashionable material and colour for travelling dresses old mrs bruff had received unusual consideration and unlimited tea but even the most systematic question failed to elicit from her anything satisfactory at any rate it was certain that croon was absent from hardhack and it was certain that he had decided on who was to be the lady of the cottage so the season of festivity was brought to an abrupt close and the digestions of hardhack were snatched from ruin from kitchen windows were now wafted odours of boiled corned beef and stewed apples instead of the fragrance of delicate preserves and delicious turkey young ladies when they met in the street greeted each other with a shade less of cordiality than usual and fathers and mothers in israel cast into each other's eyes searching and suspicious glances one afternoon when the pious matrons of hardhack were gathering at the pastor's residence to take part in the regular weekly mother's prayer meeting the mail coach rolled into town and mrs leekins who was sitting by the window as she always did exclaimed he's come back there he is on the seat with the driver every one hurried to the window and saw that mrs leekins had spoken truly 
for there sat croon with a pleasant smile on his face while on top of the stage were several large trunks marked c must have got a handsome fit out suggested mrs leekins the stage stopped at the door of croon's new cottage and croon got out the pastor entered the parlor to open the meeting and was selecting a hymn when mrs leekins startled the meeting by ejaculating lands alive the meeting was demoralized the sisters hastened to the window and the good pastor laying down his hymn-book followed in time to see croon helping out a well-dressed and apparently young and handsome lady hard hat girl not good enough for him it seems sneered mrs leekins a resigned and sympathetic sigh broke from the motherly lips present then mrs leekins cried gracious sakes married a widder with children it certainly seemed that she told the truth for croon lifted out two children the youngest of whom seemed not more than three years old the gazers abruptly left the windows and the general tone of the meeting was that of melancholy resignation why didn't he ever say he was a married man asked the prospective mrs faxton of her lover that evening partly because he is too much of a gentleman to talk of his own affairs replied faxton but principally because there had been as he told me this afternoon an unfortunate quarrel between them which drove him to the mines a few days ago he heard from her for the first time in three years and they've patched up matters and are very happy well said the lady with considerable decision hardhack will never forgive him hardhack did however for croon and his two friends drew about them a few of their old comrades who took unto themselves wives from the people about them and made of hardhack one of the pleasantest villages in the state End of story twenty two story twenty three of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty three the carmi chums the carmi chums was the name they went by all along the river most other roustabouts had each a name of his own and so had the carmi chums for that matter but the men themselves were never mentioned individually always collectively no steamboat captain who wanted only a single man ever attempted to hire half of the carmi chums at a time as easy would it have been to have hired half of the siamese twins no steamboat mate who knew them ever attempted to tell off the chums into different watches and any mate who not knowing them committed this blunder and adhered to it after explanation was made was sure to be two men short immediately after leaving the steamer's next landing there seemed no possible way of separating them they never fell out with each other in the natural course of events they never fought when drunk as other friendly roustabouts sometimes did for the carmi chums never got drunk there never sprang up any coolness between them because of love for the same lady for they did not seem to care at all for female society unless they happened to meet some old lady whom one might love as a mother rather than as a sweetheart even professional busybodies from whose presence roustabouts are no freer than church members were unable to provoke the carmi chums even to suspicion and those of them who attempted it too persistently were likely to have a difficulty with the slighter of the chums this man who was called black because of the colour of his hair was apparently forty years of age and of very ordinary appearance except when an occasional furtive frightened look came into his face and attracted attention his companion called red because his hair was of the hue of the carrots and because it was occasionally necessary to distinguish him from his friend seemed of about the same age and degree of ordinaries as black but was rather stouter more cheery and to use the favourite roustabout simile held his head closer to the current he seemed when black was absent-minded as he generally was while off duty to be the leading spirit of the couple and to be tenderly alive to all his partner's needs 
but observing roustabouts noticed that when freight was being moved or wood taken on board black was always where he could keep an eye on his chum and where he could demand instant reparation from any wretch who trod upon red's toes or who with a shoulder load of wood grazed red's head or touched red with a box or barrel next to neighborly wonder as to the existence of the friendship between the chums roustabouts with whom the couple sailed concerned themselves most with the cause of the bond between them their searches after first causes were no more successful however than those of the naturalists who were endeavouring to ascertain who laid the cosmic egg they gave out that they came from carmi so once or twice when captains with whom the chums were engaged determined to seek a cargo up the wabash upon which river carmi was located inquisitive roustabouts became light-hearted but alas for the vanity of human hopes when the boat reached carmi the chums could not be found nor could any inhabitant of carmi identify them by the descriptions which were given by inquiring friends at length they became known in their collective capacity as one of the institutions of the river captains knew them as well as they knew natchez or piankshaw bend and showing them to distinguished passengers as regularly as they showed general zack taylor's plantation or the scene of the grand gulf cave where a square mile of louisiana dropped into the river one night captains rather cultivated them in fact although it was a difficult bit of business for roustabouts who wouldn't say thank you for a glass of french brandy or a genuine old-fashioned plantation cigar seemed destitute of ordinary handles of which a steamboat captain could take hold lady passengers took considerable notice of them and were more successful than any one else at drawing them into conversation the linguistic accomplishments of the chums were not numerous but it did one good to see black lose his scared furtive look when a lady addressed him and to see the affectionate deference with which he appealed to red until that worthy was drawn into the conversation when black succeeded in this latter named operation he would by insensible stages draw himself away and give himself up to enthusiastic admiration of his partner or apparently of his conversational ability the spring of eighteen sixty nine found the chums in the crew of the bennett the peerless floating palace of the mississippi as she was called by those newspapers whose reporters had the freedom of the bennett's bar and the same season saw the bennett staggering down the mississippi with so heavy a load of sacked corn that the gunwales amidships were fairly under water the river was very low so the bennett kept carefully in the channel but the channel of the great muddy ditch which drains half the union is as fickle as disappointed lovers declare women to be and it has no more respect for greater steamer loads of corn than goliath had for david a little ohio river boat bound upward had reported the sudden disappearance of a woodyard a little way above milliken's bend where the channel hugged the shore and with the woodyard there had disappeared an enormous sycamore tree which had for years served as a tying post for steamers as live sycamores are about as disinclined to float as bars of lead are the captain and the pilot of the bennett were somewhat concerned for the sake of the corn to know the exact location of the tree half a mile from the spot it became evident even to the passengers clustered forward on the cabin deck that the sycamore had remained quite near to its old home for a long rough ripple was seen directly across the line of the channel then arose the question as to how much water was on top of the tree and whether any bar had had time to accumulate the steamer was stopped the engines were reversed and worked by hand to keep the bennett from drifting downstream a boat was lowered and manned the chums forming part of her crew and second officer went down to take soundings while the passengers to whom even so small a cause for excitement was a godsend crowded the rail and stared the boat shot rapidly downstream headed for the shore end of the ripple 
she seemed almost into the boiling mud in front of her when the passengers on the steamer heard the mate in the boat shout back all the motion of the oars changed in an instant but a little too late for a heavy root of the fallen giant just covered by the water caught the little craft and caused it to careen so violently that one man was thrown into the water as she righted another man went in confound it growled the captain who was leaning out of the pilot-house window i hope they can swim still tain't as bad as it would be if we had any more cargo to take aboard it's the chums remarked the pilot who had brought a glass to bear upon the boat thunder exclaimed the captain striking a bell below there lower away another boat lively then turning to the passengers he exclaimed nobody on the river'd forgive me if i lost the chums twould be as bad as barnum losing the giraffe the occupants of the first boat were evidently of the captain's own mind for they were eagerly peering over her side and into the water suddenly the pilot dropped his glass extemporized a trumpet with both hands and shouted forward forward one of em's up then he put his mouth to the speaking tube and screamed to the engineer let her drop down a little billy the sounding party headed toward a black speck apparently a hundred yards below them and the great steamer slowly drifted downstream the speck moved toward shore and the boat rapidly shortening distance seemed to scrape the bank with her port oars safe enough now i guess exclaimed judge turner of one of the southern illinois circuits the judge had been interrupted in telling a story when the accident occurred and was in a hurry to resume as i was saying said he he hardly looked like a professional horse thief he was little and quiet and had always worked away steadily at his trade i believed him when he said twas his first offence and that he did it to raise money to bury his child and i was going to give him an easy sentence and ask the governor to pardon him the laws have to be executed you know but there's no law against mercy being practised afterward well the sheriff was bringing him from jail to hear the verdict and the sentence when the short man with red hair knocked the sheriff down and off galloped that precious couple for the wabash i saw the entire the deuce interrupted the pilot again dropping his glass the judge glared angrily the passengers saw across the shortened distance one of the chums holding by a root to the bank and trying to support the other whose shirt hung in rags and who seemed exhausted which one's hurt asked the captain give me the glass but the pilot had left the house and taken the glass with him the judge continued i saw the whole transaction through the window i was so close that i saw the sheriff's assailant's very eyes i'd know that fellow's face if i saw it in africa why they're both hurt exclaimed the captain they've thrown a coat over one and they're crowding round the other what the oh they're coming back without em need whiskey to bring em to i suppose why didn't i send whiskey down by the other boat there's an awful amount of time being wasted here what's the matter mr bell shouted the captain as the boat approached the steamer both dead replied the officer both now ladies and gentlemen exclaimed the captain turning toward the passengers who were crowded forward just below him i want to know if that isn't a streak of the meanest kind of luck both the chums gone why i wouldn't be able to hold up my head in new orleans how came it that just those two fellers were knocked out red tumbled out and black jumped in after him replied the officer red must have been caught in an eddy and tangled in the old tree's roots clothes torn almost off head caved in black must have burst a blood vessel his face looked like a copper pan when he reached shore and he just groaned and dropped the captain was sorry so sorry that he sent a waiter for brandy but the captain was human business was business the rain was falling and a big log was across the boat's bow so he shouted hurry up and bury him then you ought to have let the second boat's crew gone on with that and you have gone back to your soundings they was the chums to be sure but now they're only dead roustabouts blow there pass out a couple of shovels perhaps some ladies would go down with the boat captain and a preacher too if there's one aboard remarked the mate with an earnest but very mysterious expression 
why what in thunder does the fellow mean soliloquized the captain audibly women and a preacher for dead roustabouts what do you mean mr bell red's a woman briefly responded the mate the passengers all started the captain brought his hands together with a tremendous clap and exclaimed murder will out but who'd have thought i was to be the man to find out the secret of the carmy chums guess i'll be the biggest man on the new orleans levee after all yes certainly of course some ladies'll go and a preacher too if there's such a man aboard hold up though we'll all go take your soundings quick and we'll drop the steamer just below the point and tie up i wonder if there's a preacher aboard no one responded for the moment then the judge spoke before i went into the law i was the regularly settled pastor of a presbyterian church said he i'm decidedly rusty now but a little time will enable me to prepare myself properly excuse me ladies and gentlemen the sounding boat pulled away and the judge retired to his stateroom the ladies with very pale faces gathered in a group and whispered earnestly with each other then ensued visits to each other's staterooms and the final regathering of the ladies with two or three bundles the soundings were taken and as the steamer dropped downstream men were seen cutting a path down the rather steep clay bank the captain put his hands to his mouth and shouted dig only one grave make it wide enough for two and all the passengers nodded assent and satisfaction time had been short since the news reached the steamer but the bennett's carpenter who was himself a married man had made a plain coffin by the time the boat tied up and another by the time the grave was dug the first one was put upon a long hand-barrow over which the captain had previously spread a tablecloth and followed by the ladies was deposited by the side of the body of red half an hour later the men placed black in the other coffin removed both to the side of the grave and signalled the boat now ladies and gentlemen said the captain the judge appeared with a very solemn face his coat buttoned tight to his throat and the party started colonel may of missouri who read voltaire and didn't believe in anything maliciously took the judge's arm and remarked you didn't finish your story judge the judge frowned reprovingly but really persisted the colonel i don't want curiosity to divert my mind from the solemn services about to take place do tell me if they ever caught the rascals they never did replied the judge the sheriff hunted and advertised but he could never hear a word of either of them but i'd know either of them at sight Psh, here we are at the grave the passengers officers and crew gathered about the grave the judge removed his hat and as the captain uncovered the faces of the dead commenced i am the resurrection and the life why there's the horse thief now colonel i beg your pardon ladies and gentlemen he that believeth in just then the judge's eye fell upon the dead woman's face and he screamed and there's the sheriff's assailant end of story twenty three story twenty four of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty four little guzzy bowerton was a very quiet place it had no factories mills or mines or other special inducements to offer people looking for new localities and as it was not on a railroad line nor even on an important post road it gained but few new inhabitants even of travellers bowerton saw very few an occasional enterprising peddler or venturesome thief found his way to the town and took away such cash as came in their way while pursuing their respective callings but peddlers were not considered exactly trustworthy as news-bearers while housebreakers when detained long enough to be questioned were not in that communicative frame of mind which is essential to one who would interest the general public when therefore the mail-coach one day brought to bowerton an old lady and a young one who appeared to be mother and daughter excitement ran high the proprietor of the bowerton house who was his own clerk hostler and table-waiter was for a day or two the most popular man in town 
even the three pastors of the trio of churches of bowerton did not consider it beneath their dignity to join the little groups which were continually to be seen about the person of the landlord and listening to the meagre intelligence he was able to give the old lady was quite feeble he said and the daughter was very affectionate and very handsome he didn't know where they were going but they registered themselves from boston name was wyatt young lady's name was helen he hoped they wouldn't leave for a long time travellers weren't any too plenty in bowerton and landlords found it hard work to scratch along talked about locating at bowerton if they could find a suitable cottage wished em well but hoped they'd take their time and not be in a hurry to leave the bowerton house where if he did say it as shouldn't they found good rooms and good board at the lowest living price the wyatts finally found a suitable cottage and soon afterward they began to receive heavy packages and boxes from the nearest railway station then it was that the responsible gossips of bowerton were working nearly to death but each one was sustained by a fine professional pride which enabled them to pass creditably through the most exciting period for years they had skilfully pried into each other's private affairs but then they had some starting space some clue now alas there was not in all bowerton a single person who had emigrated from boston where the wyatts had lived worse still there was not a single bowertonian who had a boston correspondent to be sure one of the bowerton pastors had occasional letters from a missionary board whose headquarters were at the hub but not even the most touching appeals from members of his flock could induce him to write the board concerning the newcomers but bowerton was not to be balked in its striving after accurate intelligence from squire brown who leased mrs wyatt a cottage it learned that mrs wyatt had made payment by check on an excellent boston bank the poor but respectable female who washed the floors of the cottage informed the public that the whole first floor was to be carpeted with brussels the postmaster's clerk ascertained and stated that mrs wyatt received two religious newspapers per week whereas no one else in bowerton took more than one the grocer said that mrs wyatt was by jingo the sort of person he liked to trade with wouldn't have anything that wasn't the very best the man who helped to do the unpacking was willing to take oath that among the books were a full set of barns notes and two sets of commentaries while mrs battle who lived in the house next to the cottage and who was suddenly on hearing the crashing of crockery next door moved to neighbourly kindness to the extent of carrying in a nice hot pie to the newcomers declared that as she hoped to be saved there wasn't a bit of crockery in that house which wasn't pure china bowerton asked no more brussels carpets religious tendencies a bank account the ability to live on the best that the market afforded and to eat it from china and china only why either one of these qualifications was a voucher of respectability and any two of them constituted a patent of aristocracy of the bowerton standard bowerton opened its doors and heartily welcomed mrs and miss wyatt it is grievous to relate but the coming of the estimable people was the cause of considerable trouble in bowerton bowerton like all other places contained lovers and some of the young men were not so blinded by the charms of their own particular lady friends as to be oblivious to the beauty of miss wyatt she was extremely modest and retiring but she was also unusually handsome and graceful and she had an expression which the young men of bowerton could not understand but which they greatly admired it was useless for plain girls to say that they couldn't see anything remarkable about miss wyatt it was equally unavailing for good-looking girls to caution their gallants against too much of friendly regard even for a person of whose antecedents they really knew scarcely anything 
even casting chilling looks at miss wyatt when they met her failed to make that unoffending young lady any less attractive to the young men of bowerton and critical analysis of miss wyatt's style of dressing only provoked manly comparisons which were as exasperating as they were unartistic finally jack whiffer who was of a first family and was a store clerk besides proposed to miss wyatt and was declined then the young ladies of bowerton thought that perhaps helen wyatt had some sense after all then young baggs son of a deceased congressman wished to make miss wyatt mistress of the baggs mansion and sharer of the baggs money but his offer was rejected upon learning this fact the maidens of bowerton pronounced helen a noble-spirited girl to refuse to take bags away from the dear abused woman who had been engaged to him for a long time several other young men had been seen approaching the wyatt cottage in the full glory of broadcloth and hair oil and were noticeably depressed in spirits for days afterward and the native ladies of marriageable age were correspondingly elated when they heard of it when at last the one unmarried minister of bowerton who had been the desire of many hearts manfully admitted that he had proposed and been rejected and that miss wyatt had informed him that she was already engaged all the bowerton girls declared that helen wyatt was a darling old thing and that it was perfectly shameful that she couldn't be let alone after thus proving that their own hearts were in the right place all the bowerton girls asked each other who the lucky man could be of course he couldn't be a bowerton man for miss wyatt was seldom seen in company with any gentleman he must be a boston man he was probably very literary boston men always were besides if he was at all fit for her he must certainly be very handsome suddenly miss wyatt became the rage among the bowerton girls blushingly and gushingly they told her of their own loves and they showed her their lovers or pictures of those gentlemen miss wyatt listened smiled and sympathized but when they sat silently expectant of similar confidences they were disappointed and when they endeavoured to learn even the slightest particular of helen wyatt's love she changed the subject of conversation so quickly and decidedly that they had not the courage to renew the attempt but while most bowertonians despaired of learning much more about the wyatts and especially about helen's lover there was one who had resolved not only to know the favoured man but to do him some frightful injury and that was little guzzy though guzzy's frame was small his soul was immense and helen's failure to comprehend guzzy's greatness when he laid it all at her feet had made guzzy extremely bilious and gloomy many a night when guzzy's soul and body should have been taking their rest they roamed in company up and down the quiet street on which the wyatt's cottage was located and guzzy's eyes instead of being fixed on sweet pictures in dreamland gazed vigilantly in the direction of mrs wyatt's gate he did not meditate inflicting personal violence on the hated wretch who had snatched away helen from his hopes no personal violence could produce suffering but feeble compared with that under which the victim would writhe as guzzy poured forth the torrent of scornful invective which he had compiled from the memories of his bilious brain and the pages of his webster unabridged at length there came a time when most men would have despaired love is warm but what warmth is proof against the chilling blasts and pelting rains of the equinoctial storm but then it was that the fervour of little guzzy's soul showed itself for wrapped in the folds of a waterproof overcoat he paced his accustomed beat with the calmness of a faithful policeman and he had his reward as one night he stood unseen against the black background of a high wall opposite the residence of mrs wyatt he heard the gate her gate creak on its hinges it could be no ordinary visitor for it was after nine o'clock it must be he ha ah, the lights were out he would be disappointed the villain 
now was the time while his heart would be bleeding with sorrow to wither him with reproaches to be sure he seemed a large man while guzzy was very small but guzzy believed his own thin legs to be faithful in an emergency the unknown man knocked softly at the front door then he seemed to tap at several of the windows suddenly he raised one of the windows and guzzy who had not until then suspected that he had been watching a housebreaker sped away like the wind and alarmed the solitary constable of bowerton that functionary requested guzzy to notify squire jones justice of the peace that there was business ahead and then hastened away himself guzzy laboured industriously for some moments for squire jones was very old and very cautious and very stupid but he was at last fully aroused and then guzzy had an opportunity to reflect on the greatness which would be his when bowerton knew of his meritorious action and helen wyatt what would be her shame and contrition when she learned that the man whose love she had rejected had become the preserver of her peace of mind and her portable personal property he could not exult over her for that would be unchivalrous but would not her own conscience reproach her bitterly perhaps she would burst into tears in the court-room and thank him effusively and publicly guzzy's soul swelled at the thought and he rapidly composed a reply appropriate to such an occasion suddenly guzzy heard footsteps approaching and voices in earnest altercation guzzy hastened into the squire's office and struck an attitude befitting the importance of a principal witness an instant later the constable entered followed by two smart-looking men who had between them a third man securely handcuffed the prisoner was a very handsome intelligent-looking young man except for a pair of restless overbright eyes there's a difference of opinion about who the prisoner belongs to said the constable addressing the squire and we agreed to leave the matter to you when i reached the house these gentlemen already had him in hand and they claim he's an escaped convict and that they've tracked him from the prison right straight to bowerton the prisoner gave the officers a very wicked look while these officials produced their warrants and handed them to the justice for inspection guzzy seemed to himself to grow big with accumulating importance the officer seemed to be duly authorized said the squire after a long and minute examination of their papers but they should identify the prisoner as the escaped convict for whom they are searching here's a description said one of the officers in an advertisement escaped from the penitentiary on the blank instant william bay alias bay billy alias handsome age twenty eight height five feet ten complexion dark hair black eyes dark brown mole on left cheek general appearance handsome manly and intelligent a skilful and dangerous burglar sentenced in eighteen sixty six to five years imprisonment two years yet to serve that continued the officer describes him to a dot and if there's any further doubt look here as he spoke he unclasped a cloak which the prisoner wore and disclosed the striped uniform of the prison there seems no reasonable doubt in this case and the prisoner will have to go back to prison said the justice but i must detain him while i ascertain whether he has stolen anything from mrs wyatt's residence in case he has done so we can prosecute at the expiration of his term the prisoner seemed almost convulsed with rage though of a sort which one of the officers whispered to the other he did not exactly understand guzzy eyed him resentfully and glared at the officers with considerable disfavour guzzy was a law-abiding man but to have an expected triumph belittled and postponed because of foreign interference was enough to blind almost any man's judicial eyesight well said one of the officers put him in the lock-up and investigate in the morning we won't want to start until then after the tramp he's given us oh bay billy you're a smart one no mistake about that why in thunder don't you use your smartness in the right way there's more money in business than in cracking cribs 
besides the moral advantage added the squire who was deacon as well and who now that he had concluded his official duties was not adverse to laying down the higher law just so exclaimed the officer and for his family's sake too why would you believe it judge they say billy has one of the finest wives in the commonwealth handsome well-educated religious rich and of good family of course she didn't know what his profession was when she married him again the prisoner seemed convulsed with that strange rage which the officer did not understand but the officers were tired and they were too familiar with the disapprobation of prisoners to be seriously affected by it so after an appointment by the squire and a final glare of indignation from little guzzy they started under the constable's guidance to the lock-up suddenly the door was thrown open and there appeared with uncovered head streaming hair weeping yet eager eyes and mud-splashed garments helen wyatt every one started the officers stared the squire looked a degree or two less stupid and hastened to button his dressing-gown the restless eyes of the convict fell on helen's beautiful face and were restless no longer while little guzzy assumed a dignified pose which did not seem at all consistent with his confused and shamefaced countenance we may as well finish this case to-night if miss wyatt is prepared to testify said the squire at length have you lost anything miss wyatt no said helen but i have found my dearest treasure my own husband and putting her arms around the convict's neck she kissed him and then dropping her head upon his shoulder she sobbed violently the squire was startled into complete wakefulness and as the moral aspect of the scene presented itself to him he groaned unequally yoked with an unbeliever the officers looked as if they were depraved yet remorseful convicts themselves while little guzzy's diminutive dimensions seemed to contract perceptibly at length the convict quieted his wife and persuaded her to return to her home with a promise from the officers that she should see him in the morning then the officers escorted the prisoner to the jail and guzzy sneaked quietly out while the squire retired to his slumbers with the firm conviction that if solomon had been a justice of the peace at bowerton his denial of the newness of anything under the sun would never have been made now the jail at bowerton like everything else in the town was decidedly antiquated and consisted simply of a thickly walled room in a building which contained several offices and living apartments it was as extensive a jail as bowerton needed and was fully strong enough to hold the few drunken and quarrelsome people who were occasionally lodged in it but bay alias bay billy alias handsome was no ordinary and vulgar jail-bird the officers told him and that he and they might sleep securely they considered it advisable to carefully iron his hands a couple of hours rolled away and left bay still sitting moody and silent on the single bedstead in the bowerton jail suddenly the train of his thoughts was interrupted by a low from one little high-graded window of the jail the prisoner looked up quickly and saw the shadow of a man's head outside the grating hello whispered bay hurrying under the window are you alone inquired the shadow yes replied the prisoner all right then whispered the voice there are secrets which no vulgar ear should hear my name is guzzy i have been in love with your wife i hadn't any idea she was married but i brought you my apology i'll forgive you whispered the criminal but tain't that kind of apology whispered guzzy it's a steel one a tool one of those things that gunsmiths shorten gun barrels with if they can saw a rifle barrel in two and five minutes you ought to get out of here inside of an hour not quite whispered bay my hands and feet are ironed then i'll do the job myself whispered guzzy as he applied the tool to one of the bars for it will be daylight within two hours the unaccustomed labor for guzzy was a bookkeeper made his arms ache severely but still he sawed away he wondered what his employer would say should he be found out but still he sawed 
visions of the uplifted hands and horror-struck countenances of his brother church members came before his eyes and the effect of his example upon his sunday school class should he be discovered tormented his soul but neither of these influences affected his saw bar after bar disappeared and when guzzy finally stopped to rest bay saw a small square of black sky unobstructed by any bars whatever now whispered guzzy i'll drop in a small box you can stand on so you can put your hands out and let me file off your irons i brought a file or two thinking they might come handy five minutes later the convict his hands unbound crawled through the window and was helped to the ground by guzzy seizing the file from the little bookkeeper bay commenced freeing his feet suddenly he stopped and whispered you'd better go now i can take care of myself but if those cursed officers should take a notion to look around it would be hard with you run god bless you run but little guzzy straightened himself and folded his arms the convict rasped away rapidly and finally dropped the file and the fragments of the last fetter then he seized little guzzy's hand my friend said he criminal though i am i am man enough to appreciate your manliness and honour i think i am smart enough to keep myself free now i am out of jail but if ever you want a friend tell helen she will know where i am and i will serve you no matter what the risk and pain thank you said guzzy but the only favour i'll ever ask of you might as well be named now and you ought to be able to do it without risk or pain either it's only this be an honest man for helen's sake bay dropped his head there are men who would die daily for the sake of making her happy but you've put it out of their power seeing you've married her continued guzzy i'm nothing to her and can't be but for her sake to-night i've broken open the gunsmith's shop broken a jail and here he stooped and picked up a bundle robbed my own employer's store of a suit of clothes for you so you mayn't be caught again in those prison stripes if i've made myself a criminal for her sake can't her husband be an honest man for the same reason the convict wrung the hand of his preserver he seemed to be trying to speak but to have some great obstruction in his throat suddenly a bright light shone on the two men and a voice was heard exclaiming in low but very ferocious tones do it you scoundrel or i'll put a bullet through your head both men looked up to the window of the cell and saw a bull's-eye lantern the muzzle of a pistol and the face of the bowerton constable the constable's right eye the sights of his pistol and the breast of the convict were on the same visual line without altering his position or that of his weapon the constable whispered i've had you covered for the last ten minutes i only held in to find out who was helping you but i heard too much for my credit as a faithful officer now what are you going to do turn over a new leap said the convict bursting into tears then get out whispered the officer and be lively too it's almost daybreak i'll tell you what to do said little guzzy when the constable hurriedly whispered wait until i get out of hearing the excitement which possessed bowerton the next morning when the events of the previous night were made public was beyond the descriptive powers of the best linguists in the village helen wyatt a burglar's wife at first the bowertonian scarcely knew whether it would be proper to recognize her at all and before they were able to arrive at a conclusion the intelligence of the convict's escape the breaking open of the gunsmith's shop the finding of the front door of cashing's store ajar and the discovery by cashing that at least one suit of valuable clothing had been taken came upon the astonished villagers and rendered them incapable of reason and of every other mental attribute except wonder that the prisoner had an accomplice seemed certain and some suspicious souls suggested that the prisoner's wife might have been the person but as one of the officers declared he had watched her house all night for fear of some such attempt that theory was abandoned under the guidance of the constable who zealously assisted them in every possible manner the officers searched every house in bowerton that might seem likely to afford a hiding-place and then departed on what they considered the prisoner's most likely route 
for some days helen wyatt gave the bowertonians no occasion to modify their conduct toward her for she kept herself constantly out of sight when however she did appear in the street again she met only the kindest looks and salutations for the venerable squire jones had talked incessantly in praise of her courage and affection and the squire's fellow-townsmen knew that when their principal magistrate was affected to tenderness and mercy it was from causes which would have simply overwhelmed any ordinary mortal it was months before bowerton gossip descended again to its normal level for a few weeks after the escape of bay little guzzy who had never been supposed to have unusual credit and whose family certainly hadn't any money left his employer and started an opposition store next to small scandal finance was the favourite burden of conversation at bowerton so the source of guzzy's sudden prosperity was so industriously sought and surmised that the gossips were soon at needles points about it then it was suddenly noised abroad that mrs baggs senior who knew everybody had given guzzy a letter of introduction to the governor of the state bowerton was simply confounded what could he want the governor had very few appointments at his disposal and none of them were fit for guzzy except those for which guzzy was not fit even the local politicians became excited and both sides consulted guzzy finally when guzzy started for the state capital and helen wyatt as people still called her accompanied him the people of bowerton put on the countenances of hopeless resignation and of a mute expectation which nothing could astonish it might be an elopement it might be that they were going as missionaries but no one expressed a positive opinion and every one expressed a perfect willingness to believe anything that was supported by even a shadow of proof their mute agony was suddenly ended for within forty-eight hours guzzy and his travelling companion returned the latter seemed unusually happy for the wife of a convict while the former went straight to squire jones and the constables half an hour later all bowerton knew that william bay alias bay billy alias handsome had received a full and free pardon from the governor the next day bowerton saw a tall handsome stranger with downcast eyes walk rapidly through the principal street and disappear behind mrs wyatt's gate a day later and bowerton was electrified by the intelligence that the ex-burglar had been installed as a clerk in guzzy's store people said that it was a shame that nobody knew how soon bay might take to his old tricks again nevertheless they crowded to guzzy's store to look at him until shrewd people began to wonder whether guzzy hadn't really taken bay as a sort of advertisement to draw trade a few months later however they changed their opinions for the constable after the expiration of his term of office and while under the influence of a glass too much related the whole history of the night of bay's first arrival at bowerton the bowertonians were law-abiding people but somehow guzzy's customers increased from that very day and his prosperity did not decline even after guzzy bay was the sign over the door of the store which had been built and stocked with mrs wyatt's money End of story twenty four story twenty five of romance of california life by john haberton this librivox recording is in the public domain story twenty five a romance of happy rest happy rest is a village whose name has never appeared in gazetteer or census report this remark should not cause any depreciation of the faithfulness of public and private statisticians for happy rest belonged to a class of settlements which sprang up about as suddenly as did jonah's gourd and after a short existence disappeared so quickly that the last inhabitant generally found himself alone before he knew that anything unusual was going on when the soil of happy rest supported nothing more artificial than a broken wagon-wheel left behind by some immigrants going overland to california a deserter from a fort near by discovered that the soil was auriferous 
his statement to that effect made in a bar-room in the first town he reached thereafter led to his being invited to drink which operation resulted in certain supplementary statements and drinks within three hours every man within five miles of that bar-room knew that the most paying dirt on the continent had been discovered not far away and three hours later a large body of gold hunters guided by the deserter were en route for the auriferous locality while a storekeeper and a liquor dealer with their respective stocks in trade followed closely after the ground was found it proved to be tolerably rich tents went up underground residences were burrowed and the grateful miners ordered the barkeeper to give unlimited credit to the locality's discoverer the barkeeper obeyed the order and the ex-warrior speedily met his death in a short but glorious contest with john barleycorn there was no available lumber from which to construct a coffin and the storekeeper had no large boxes but as the liquor seller had already emptied two barrels these were taken neatly joined in the centre and made to contain the remains of the founder of the hamlet the method of his death and origin of his coffin led a spiritous miner to suggest that he rested happily and from this remark the name of the town was elaborated of course no ladies accompanied the expedition men who went west for gold did not take their families with them as a rule and the settlers of the new mining towns were all of the masculine gender when a town had attained to the dignity of a hotel members of the gentler sex occasionally appeared but with the exception of an occasional washerwoman their influence was decidedly the reverse of that usually attributed to woman's society for the privileges of their society men fought with pistols and knives and bought of them a disgrace and sorrow for gold but at first happy rest was unblessed and uncursed by the presence of any one who did not wear pantaloons on the fifth day of its existence however when the arrival of an express agent indicated that capital had formally acknowledged the existence of happy rest there was an unusual commotion in the never quiet village an important rumour had spread among the tents and gopher holes and one after another the citizens visited the saloon took the barkeeper mysteriously aside and with faces denoting the greatest concern whispered earnestly to him the barkeeper felt his importance as the sole custodian of all the village news but he replied with affability to all questions well yes there had a lady come come by the same stage as the express agent what kind well he really couldn't say some might think one way and some another he thought she was a real lady though she wouldn't allow anything to be sent her from the bar and she hadn't brought no baggage thought so knowed she was a lady in fact would bet drinks for the crowd on it cause why well cause nobody heard her cuss or seed her laugh he'd bet three to two she was a lady might bet two to one if he got his dander up on the subject then on t'other hand she'd axed for major axel and the major as everybody knowed was well he wasn't exactly a saint besides as the major hadn't come to happy rest nohow it looked as if he was dodging her for something where was she stoppin up to old psalm singers old psalm bed turned himself out of house and home and bought her a new tea-kettle to boot if anybody knowed anybody that wanted to take three to two send em along a few men called to bet and bets were exchanged all over the camp but most of the excitement centred about the storekeepers argonauts pioneers heroes or whatever else the early gold seekers were they were likewise mortal men so they competed vigorously for the few blacking brushes boxes of blacking looking-glasses pocket combs and neckties which the store contained they bought toilet soap and borrowed razors and when they had improved their personal appearance to the fullest possible extent they stood aimlessly about like unemployed workmen in the market-place each one however took up a position which should rake the only entrance to old psalm singer's tent 
suddenly two or three scores of men struck various attitudes as if to be photographed and exclaimed in unison there she is from the tent of old psalmsinger there had emerged the only member of the gentler sex who had reached happy rest for only a moment she stood still and looked about her as if uncertain which way to go but before she had taken a step old psalmsinger raised his voice and said i thought it last night when i only seed her in the moonlight but i know it now she's a lady and no mistake if i was a bettin man i'd bet all my dust on it and my farm to hum besides a number of men immediately announced that they would bet in the speaker's place to any amount and in almost any odds for though old psalm by reason of non-participation in any of the drinks fights or games with which the camp refreshed itself was considered a mere non-entity it was generally admitted that men of his style could tell a lady or a preacher at sight the gentle unknown finally started toward the largest group of men seeing which several smaller groups massed themselves on the larger with alacrity as she neared them the men could see that she was plainly dressed but that every article of attire was not only neat but tasteful and that she had enough grace of form and carriage to display everything to advantage a few steps nearer and she displayed a set of sad but refined features marred only by an irresolute purposeless mouth then an ex-reporter from new york turned suddenly to a graceless young scamp who had once been a regular ornament to broadway and exclaimed louise matray isn't it tis by thunder replied the young man i knew i'd seen her somewhere wonder what she's doing here the reporter shrugged his shoulders some wild goose speculation i suppose smart and gritty if i had her stick i shouldn't be here but she always slips up can't keep all her wires well in hand was an advertising agent when i left the east picked up a good many ads too and made folks treat her respectfully when they'd have kicked a man out of doors if he'd come to the same errand say she's been asking for axel remarked the young man that's so queried the reporter wrinkling his brow and hurrying through his mental notebook oh yes there was some talk about them at one time some said they were married she said so but she never took his name she had a handsome son that looked like her and the major but she didn't know how to manage him went to the dogs or worse before he was eighteen axel here asked the young man no replied the reporter and twouldn't do her any good if he was the major's stylish and good-looking and plays a brilliant game but he hasn't any more heart than is absolutely necessary to his circulation besides his the reporter was interrupted by a heavy hand falling on his shoulder and found on turning that the hand belonged to the general the general was not a military man but his title had been conferred in recognition of the fact that he was a born leader wherever he went the general assumed the reins of government and his administration had always been popular as well as judicious but at this particular moment the general seemed to feel unequal to what was evidently his duty and he like a skilful general sought a properly qualified assistant and the reporter seemed to him to be just the man he wanted spider tracks said the general with an air in which authority and supplication were equally prominent you've told an awful sight of lies in your time don't deny it now nobody that ever reads the papers will believe you now's your chance to put your gift of gab to a respectable use the lady's bothered and wants to say something or ask something and she'll understand your lingo better than mine fire away now lively the ex shorthand writer seemed complimented by the general's address and stepping forward and raising the remains of what had once been a hat said can i serve you in any way madam the lady glanced at him quickly and searchingly and then seeming assured of the reporter's honesty replied i am looking for an old acquaintance of mine one major axel he is not in camp ma'am said spider tracks he was at rum valley a few days ago when our party was organized to come here 
i was there yesterday said the lady looking greatly disappointed and was told he started for here a day or two before some mistake ma'am i assure you replied spider tracks i should have known of his arrival if he had come i'm an old newspaper man ma'am and can't get out of the habit of getting the news the lady turned away but seemed irresolute the reporter followed her if you will return to rum valley ma'am i'll find the major for you if he is hereabouts said he you will be more comfortable there and i will be more likely than you to find him the lady hesitated for a moment longer then she drew from her pocket a diary wrote a line or two on one of its leaves tore it out and handed it to the reporter i will accept your offer and be very grateful for it for i do not bear this mountain travelling very well if you find him give him this scrawl and tell him where i am that will be sufficient trust me to find him ma'am replied spider tracks and as the stage is just starting and there won't be another for a week allow me to see you into it any baggage only a small handbag in the tent said she they hurried off together spider tracks found the bag and five minutes later was bowing and waving his old hat to the cloud of dust which the departing stage left behind it but when even the dust itself had disappeared he drew from his pocket the paper the fair passenger had given him tain't sealed said he reasoning with himself so there can't be any secrets in it let's see hello ernest is somewhere in this country i wish to see you about him and about nothing else whew what a splendid material for a column if there was only a live paper in this infernal country looking for that young scamp eh huh? there is something to her and i'll help her if i can wonder if i'd recognize him if i saw him again i ought to if he looks as much like his parents as he used to do twould do my soul good to make the poor woman smile once but it's an outrageous shame there's no good daily paper here to work the whole thing up in with the chase and fighting and murder that may come of it twould make the leading sensation for a week the agonized reporter clasped his hands behind him and walked slowly back to where he had left the crowd most of the citizens had on seeing the lady depart taken a drink as a partial antidote to dejection and strolled away to their respective claims regardless of the occasional mud which threatened the polish on their boots but two or three gentlemen of irascible tempers and judicial minds lingered to decide whether spider tracks had not by the act of seeing the lady to the stage made himself an accessory to her departure and consequently a fit subject for challenge by every disappointed man in camp the reporter was in the midst of a very able and voluble defence when the attention of his hearers seemed distracted by something on the trail by which the original settlers had entered the village spider tracks himself looked shaded his eyes indulged in certain disconnected fragments of profanity and finally exclaimed axel himself by the white coat of horace greeley wonder who he's got with him they seem to be having a difficulty about something the gentleman who had arraigned spider tracks allowed him to be acquitted by default far better to them was a fight near by than the most interesting lady far off they stuck their hands into their pockets and stared intently finally one of them in a tone of disgusted resignation remarked axel ought to be ashamed of hisself he's dragged along a little feller not half the size he is blamed if he ain't got his match though the little feller's just doin some glorious chawin and diggin the excitement finally overcame the inertia of the party and each man started deliberately to meet the major and his captive spider tracks faithful to his profession kept well in advance of the others suddenly he exclaimed to himself good lord don't they know each other the major didn't wear that beard when he was in new york but the boy he's just the same scamp in spite of his dirt and rags if she were to see them now but pshaw twould all fall flat no live paper to take hold of the matter and work it up 
there curse your treacherous heart roared the major as he gave his prisoner a push which threw him into the reporter's arms now we're in a civilized community and you'll have a chance of learning the opinion of gentlemen on such irregularities tried to kill me gentlemen upon my honor did it after i had shared my eatables and pocket pistol with him too did it to get my dust got me at a disadvantage for a moment and made a formal demand for the dust and backed his request with a pistol my own pistol gentlemen i've only just reached here i don't yet know who's here but i imagine there's public spirit enough to discourage treachery will some one see to him while i take something spider tracks drew his revolver mildly touched the young man on the shoulder and remarked come on the ex-knight of the pencil bowed his prisoner into an abandoned gopher hole i e an artificial cave cocked his revolver and then stretched himself on the ground and devoted himself to staring at the unfortunate youth to a student of human nature ernest mattray was curious fascinating and repulsive short slight handsome delicate nervous unscrupulous selfish effeminate dishonest and cruel he was an excellent specimen of what city life could make of a boy with no father and an irresolute mother the reporter who had many a time studied faces in the tombs felt almost as if at his old vocation again as he gazed into the restless eyes and sullen features of the prisoner meanwhile happy rest was becoming excited there had been some little fighting done since the settlement of the place but as there had been no previous attempt at highway robbery and murder made in the vicinity the prisoner was an object of considerable interest in fact the major told so spirited a story that most of the inhabitants strolled up one after another to look at the innovator while that individual himself with the modesty which seems inseparable from true greatness retired to the most secluded of the three apartments into which the cave was divided and declined all the attentions which were thrust upon him the afternoon had faded almost into evening when a decrepit figure in a black dress and bonnet approached the cave and gave spider tracks a new element for the thrilling report he had composed and mentally rearranged during his few hours of duty as jailer beats the dickens muttered the reporter to himself how these sisters of charity always know when a tough case has been caught natural enough in new york but where did she come from who told her cross beads and all hello oh louise mattray you're a deep one but it's a pity your black robe isn't quite long enough to hide the very tasty dress you wore this morning queer dodge too wonder what it means wonder if she's caught sight of the major and don't want to be recognized the figure approached may i see the prisoner she asked no one has a better right mrs mattray said the guardian of the cave with a triumphant smile while the poor woman started and trembled don't be frightened no one is going to hurt you heard all about it i suppose know who just missed being the victim yes said the unhappy woman entering the cave when she emerged it was growing quite dark she passed the reporter with head and veil down and whispered thank you don't mention it said the reporter quickly going to stay until you see how things go with him she shook her head and passed on the sky grew darker the reporter almost wished it might grow so dark that the prisoner could escape unperceived or so quickly that a random shot could not find him there were strange noises in camp the storekeeper who never travelled except by daylight was apparently harnessing his mules to the wagon he was moving the wagon itself to the extreme left of the camp where there was nothing to haul but wood and even that was still standing in the shape of fine old trees there seemed to be an unusual clearness in the air for spider tracks distinctly heard the buzz of some earnest conversation there seemed a strange shadows floating in the air a strange sense of something moving toward him something almost shapeless yet tangible something that approached him that gave him a sense of insecurity and then of alarm 
suddenly the indefinable something uttered a yell and resolved itself into a party of miners led by the gallant and aggrieved major himself who shouted lynch the scoundrel boys that's the only thing to do the excited reporter sprang to his feet in an agony of genuine humanity and suppressed itemizing and screamed major wait a minute you'll be sorry if you don't but the gallant major had been at the bar for two or three hours preparing himself for this valorous deed and the courage he had there imbibed knew not how to brook delay not until the crowd had reached the mouth of the cave and found it dark and had heard one unduly prudent miner suggest that it might be well to have a light so as to dodge being sliced in the dark bring a light quick then shouted the major i'll drag him out when it comes he knows my grip curse him a bunch of dried grass was hastily lighted and thrown into the cave and the major rapidly followed it while as many miners as could crowd in after him hastened to do so they found the major with white face and trembling limbs standing in front of the lady for whose sake they had done so much elaborate dressing in the morning and who they had afterwards wrathfully seen departing in the stage the major rallied turned round and said there's some mistake here gentlemen won't you have the kindness to leave us alone slowly uh, very slowly the crowd withdrew it seemed to them that in the nature of things the lady ought to have it out with the major with pistols or knives for disturbing her and that they who were in all the sadness of disappointment at failure of a well-planned independent execution ought to see the end of the whole affair but a beseeching look from the lady herself finally cleared the cave and the major exclaimed louise what does this mean it means said the lady with most perfect composure that thanks to a worthless father and a bad bringing up by an incapable mother ernest has found his way into this country i came to find him and i found him in this hole to which his affectionate father had brought him to-day it is about as well i imagine that i helped him to escape seeing to what further kind attentions you had reserved him please don't be so icy louise begged the major he attempted to rob and kill me the young rascal besides i had not the faintest idea of who he was perhaps said the lady still very calm you will tell me from whom he inherited the virtues which prompted his peculiar actions towards you his mother has always earned her livelihood honourably louise said the major with a humility which would have astonished his acquaintance won't you have the kindness to reserve your sarcasm until i am better able to bear it you probably think i have no heart i acknowledge i have thought as much myself but something is making me feel very weak and tender just now the lady looked critically at him for a moment and then burst into tears oh god she sobbed what else is there in store for this poor miserable injured life of mine restitution whispered the major softly if you will let me make it or try to make it the weeping woman looked up inquiringly and said only the words and she my first wife answered the major dead really dead louise as i hope to be saved she died several years ago and i longed to do you justice then but the memory of our parting was too much for my cowardly soul if you will take me as i am louise i will as long as i live remember the past and try to atone for it she put her hand in his and they left the gopher hole together as they disappeared in the outer darkness there emerged from one of the compartments of the cave an individual whose features were indistinguishable in the darkness but who was heard to emphatically exclaim if i had the dust i'd start a live daily here just to tell the whole story though the way he got out didn't do me any particular credit for days the residents of happy rest used all available mental stimulants to aid them in solving the mystery of the major and the wonderful lady but as the mental stimulants aforesaid were all spiritous the results were more deplorable than satisfactory but when a few days later the couple took the stage for rum valley 
the enterprising spider tracks took an outside passage and at the end of the route had his persistency rewarded by seeing in the bang-up house a sister of charity tenderly embrace the major's fair charge start at the side of the major and then after some whispering by the happy mother sullenly extend a hand which the major grasped heartily and over which there dropped something which though a drop of water was not a raindrop then did spider tracks return to the home of his adoption and lavish the stores of his memory and for days his name was famous and his liquor was paid for by admiring auditors End of story 25